Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy Sabbath. I want to invite you all to our message of the hour. The story of the extravagant father. Uh, this message uh, comes to us uh, from a very well-known story that was said by none other than Jesus. And when Jesus told this story, uh, many readers have named it the story of the prodigal son. Uh, but probably the intention of Jesus was really not about the son. Uh, there are many things about this story that might escape us, simple as it is, simply because we come from a different cultural, linguistic perspective from the people that Jesus spoke to. And I have been digging this story for almost a year now, uh, trying to compare uh, languages, and I found a lot of uh, gems in the Swahili language which I speak, and which many people in the audience speak. I'll be using a lot of Swahili to help us get to the, the reason why Jesus was saying this story. The reason Jesus was telling this story was to talk about himself, the father of us all, very extravagant father, full of so much love that he wants to share with us. And, uh, many people have also looked at the story and looked at it thinking it is about repentance. And uh, most churches interpret it to be, at best, us coming to Jesus in repentance and getting forgiveness, which is also true. But the reason why Jesus gave the story would probably be a little bit different. So let's get into the story. And uh, we want to see, first of all, why Jesus was giving this story, which is found in the book of uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 3. And uh, as you can see from this book, there are actually three stories in one. It's called a trilogy. And uh, the reason he gave it is that the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so, he told them this parable. So you find there the reason why he's telling the story is because they grumbled about him receiving sinners and tax collectors. Uh, they thought that Jesus is probably keeping bad company. He's too good for these people. Uh, they could be tarnishing his wow. reputation. He shouldn't hang around with sinners. For Jesus, to answer them back, he told them a series of three parables. We are not going to look at the first two. We will jump straight to the last parable. And uh, so he said that there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. You know, in Swahili it was saying, Inayo ni angukia. It is like falling in my laps. It is mine. It's also in my Luo culture, which we, the Luo people where is, I was born, who came from this cradle of Egypt, and they followed the Nile, and then settled around Lake Victoria in Kenya. We share a lot of culture and customs and ways with these people. So in our culture, it's exactly the same. There is a pecking order in which property is divided. In the Aussie culture, you lose your parents, 
the property goes to the sons and the daughters, and they can do whatever they like with it. They can sell it the following day, no questions asked. But in our culture, you can't do that. Nobody will even buy it. It's a valuable property, but sometimes the value is intrinsically in the community. Nobody will just come and live there. They will not fit in. So this is a culture where Jesus is speaking to, a similar culture. And uh, the boy is now asking for his share that is falling on his side. What belongs to him? There's also a pecking order there in our culture where the older brother will be getting one portion of the property and the younger brother, the follower, will go automatically to the other side. And everybody knows that. So there are things that Jesus was speaking here to them that they could connect. That's what I'm trying to say. He didn't have to explain it to them because that's how their culture was. But we have to go into those nuances and dig out what he meant. And the word that he's using here for inheritance, which the boy demands, is not the same word that has been used in the Bible in many places, like in the book of Matthew, where there is a story of a, a man who had a property and he had servants there, and he sent uh, his servants to the people who had rented the property. And they saw the servants and they killed the servants. Then he said, maybe I'll send my son. Maybe they'll listen to my son. And he sent his son. The people said, when they saw the son, they said, when they saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. Uh, that word used there is the Greek word kleronomia. That word in Swahili is urithi. And he's not using that word here. He's using another word called usia. Usia, which is actually a Swahili word, which spells like a, a will, like a testament. You may all have heard of the big story now going in the news where the sons of Rupert Murdoch are fight, fighting over the will. Big in the news. They're not fighting for wealth. They are very wealthy already, but they're fighting over that will. So there's all this... Uh, nuances about this inheritance and will. So the, the boy is actually just asking for something that he can quickly cash out and disconnect himself from the family, disconnect himself from the community and move on. Because you see, inheritance is when the parents pass away in our culture, the family, the boys especially, will remain. And they will work hard and make it grow. They will not sell it. But this boy, he wants a situation where he can cut out and ship out. He wants to move on. He's not interested in any way of taking the responsibility and the rights that come with the inheritance. Because that's what inheritance means. And to ask one's father for one's share of the inheritance early was unheard of in antiquity. In effect, one would thereby say, Father, I wish you were already dead. Uh, such a statement would not go over very well even today. And in society, stressing obedience to one's father, it would be a serious act of rebellion for which the father could have beaten him or worse. We get this from the Bible background commentary, page 233. So you see that the boy is dealing with some very complex issues here. Uh, he's essentially rebelling. He's, he's, he's being a rebel. He's, re, he's removing himself. He's rebelling from the father. He's cutting his ties from the family. He's moving away from the community. He doesn't want any responsibility. And he wants an easy way out. But according to the laws in Deuteronomy, uh, the firstborn would receive a double portion, even in my community. Uh, the first boy will get a double portion of what the other boys get. Like if you come to my family, we are five boys. The elder brother has got a big portion, double what us younger brothers have got. And that was 
a law in Deuteronomy that the firstborn will receive a double portion and and in this case, the younger son's portion would only have been one third because there are two boys. So if the older boy is getting two, the younger one is remaining with one out of three. So if you divide the property three times because there are only two, he's got two already, two thirds. What is remaining out of two thirds? One third. So he, he wants his one third to move on. And that, uh, the, the citation is there in the book of Deuteronomy 21.17 which said that was a law that was given uh, for the man to honor the first fruit of his loins, who is the firstborn. So not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, we are told. It's interesting that not many days later, after he has gotten his share. You know, that not many days later is very telling. You know, Jesus wants you to see something there. He wants you to see that the boy must have probably hurriedly sold everything. Probably could have called in people from the community, put notices around the market. You no, know, goods going for cheap. You no, know, make us an offer. You know, embarrass the father. The father is probably hiding and can't see his hard-earned property going for nothing. Villagers are laughing at them as they take away goods. And he's selling cheap, he's selling cheap. And in not many days later, he gathered all. That, that gathered all tells you that it was in a form of cash. Because he couldn't have gathered big Immovable properties, even cattle, for example, animals. He couldn't have gathered that. He gathered cash. Because the story will later tell you that he spent it. And he took a journey into a far country. That's taking a journey tells you that he cut himself from his community. He's got a community element in it. You know, this, these things, they go with the community. The, 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 the whole reason why Jesus is saying this parable to them is that it's a community affair. You belong to the community in these cultures and the, whatever you do affects other members of the community. And uh, certainly it affected the family. It affected the father. Uh, the father would have felt a lot of pain. Uh, the relationship was strained. Uh, probably his brother, they were no longer in talking terms. Uh, nobody cared uh, to hear him anymore, and he didn't care about anybody again. And his intention and his vision was just to go into a far country. He's got the sights into uh, this country, and he's moving to this country where Jesus says in the story that he squandered his property in reckless living. He went there and he he gambled the money, he, he drank the money, whatever he did with the money, he quickly squandered the property in reckless living. He didn't think of investing. He probably had those ideas when he was selling. When he got there, he was overwhelmed. You know, sometimes that's why God may be afraid of even giving us so much money and so much resources because he probably is afraid that he will lose us. When you go into this far country in reckless living and squandering all. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. And he began to be in need. That's what he began. It was gradual. He realizes that, you know, his friends are leaving him. He can't, he can't eat the way he used to eat. He can't frequent the, the places he used to go to. He can't afford certain things. The money is fast disappearing from his hands. And he also hears that there's a severe famine that has gripped the country. He's thinking of what are his options? You know, at this time, he probably started considering his options, laying them bare, thinking 
Probably, should I go back? Maybe that was not an option. Because going back meant facing the community. It meant, it meant facing the uh, rage of his brother. It meant facing the father. And that was a no-no. Because in that community, there was this ceremony that they performed. It's called the Kizaza. This Kizaza ceremony is actually like a Swahili word, which is the root word is Kisasi. Kisasi, as you know, is to, to revenge, to pay back. So what the community would do in the Jewish community is to literally, when he comes back, they would take a pot and they would break it in front of him and say his name and say that he has been cut out from the community. And they would be so angry and they would be casting him out and nobody would want to accept him back in. The whole community will judge you. For so he realized that that is an option he's facing. At Kizaza ceremony, he says that if a Jewish boy lost his family inheritance among the Gentiles and sought to return home, the community would perform the ceremony by breaking a large pot in front of him and declare so and so is cut off from his people. You are cut off from the community completely. And the boy knows this. So going home, he has to think about that. The Dead Sea Scrolls tells us something to that effect. And now, my sons, be watchful of your inheritance that has been bequeathed to you, which your fathers gave you. Do not give your inheritance to the Gentiles, lest you be humiliated in their eyes and be foolish, and they trample upon you and become your masters. So there was warning everywhere about being careful not to squander your inheritance among the Gentiles. This man, this boy has cut out that option of going back home. It's no longer there. He has to consider other options. And, uh, and so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. When Jesus is telling them this story, there are elements that he's mentioning there, like pigs. That is what is making us know that this was a Gentile land because they would be keeping pigs. It's probably the other Decapolis where he went and he, he moved those demons from the man of Gadara and, and the demons went into the pigs and the pigs were drowned. Remember that story? He's probably gone there. So this boy traveled far. But it is interesting that Jesus is mentioning that he hired himself out. Have you ever seen anybody hiring himself? Can you go to the bank and hire yourself? Can you, can you, can you just walk into a corporation and say, <laughs> I'm hiring myself here? What does Jesus mean? You know, it's probably like these people who stick to you, like, you know, if you go to these big cities, even in here, I've seen it in St. Kilda, actually. Some, you'll park your car in the lights and somebody will jump out and clean your windshield and they expect a payment. You know, they, they cling to you. They, 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 they want you to... So this man hired himself. He, he, he clung to this man because the Swahili word there is akashikamana. He... he he attached himself to this man. He, he, he couldn't let him go. Everywhere this man turned, he was there asking for, for work. Everywhere this man went, he was there. This word is used elsewhere in reference from everything, from dust clinging on, on our feet, where Jesus said, if you go to a city and they don't welcome you, you know, remove the dust that has clung on your feet and move on. It is also used once when it says, about joining oneself with a prostitute. The same word. And so this man has hired himself out. Akashikamana. He has clung to this man. And, and this man must have read him right because he must have seen him and looked at him. His accent, his demeanor, the way he carried himself, he must have known this is a Hebrew boy. I know what I'll do to get him off my back. 
I will send him to the pigs. Maybe he will say, no, he can't do that. But Jesus wants you to see that he was so desperate. He was at such a low point that even that he accepted. And he accepted to go and look after pigs. So revolting to a Hebrew boy who had never been close or near pigs. So he was cleaning and doing all this work with the pigs. And it said there that, and he was even longing to be fed with the pots that the pigs ate. No one gave him anything. Some commentators say that the pods that the pigs ate were so hard that they had to be like fermented first and, and, and made soft and then the pigs would eat it. So he, could, he, he even desired to eat that. But they were not fit for human consumption. So he knew he could not eat it. He had sunk that low and nobody gave him anything. That was not an option. He couldn't just walk somewhere like here and get bread. You know, jump into a, a bin behind a supermarket somewhere and get food. He couldn't do that. There was famine in the land. Everybody was going through hard times. So the boy's world is narrowing by the day. And, uh, but when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? You know, suddenly, he remembered that how many of my father's hired servants Eat bread and throw away. And here I am in this strange land, <laughs> perishing with hunger. You know, this is the part where many people teach that he repented when he came to himself. It is far from it. There is no indication there. Jesus is not using that word. That when he repented, he could have said it. It's not about repentance. He has not repented. He, he just realizes that he needs to eat or he will perish. And so, he says to himself that I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Even that part that I will arise is not repentance. Because he is qualifying it. Jesus is showing you what is going on in his mind. I will say to him, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Did you catch that? He's not saying, receive me back as your son with the full responsibility of looking after the property. And I am sorry. I will be there. I will work. I will do my bit. He's not sorry. And uh, it is interesting that what Jesus is speaking Aramaic, okay? And the same words that Jesus uses are the same words that are used in Exodus 10, 16, when Pharaoh was in dire straits. And he says, I have sinned against the Lord, your God, and against you. He said it to Moses. In order to get himself out of a sticky situation, and the Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Pharaoh was not repentant. We all know that Pharaoh was not repentant. The story tells, tells us. And those words, the father, the son says, I have sinned against heaven and before you. The same words, I have sinned against the Lord, your God, and against you. The Aramaic version of the same is word for word. The words, the, the, the language that Jesus was speaking, it is word for word. And he's speaking to an intellectual group, 
scribes and Pharisees, they know the story of Moses and Pharaoh. They can connect it very quickly and they know where Jesus is. He doesn't have to tell you in the story. So in other words, Jesus is telling them that the boy is not repentant. He's simply looking for a way out of his hunger. He's looking for a way out of his situation. So, and he arose and he came to his father. You know, as he's coming to his father, he's probably reciting his speech. He's probably thinking of the Kizaza ceremony and how he will handle that with the community. He's probably thinking that even by the time he, he, the community gets wind that he's around, they will have already devoured him before he can reach his father to present his case. And uh, he's reciting it over and over again. He's talking about how he can survive, not how he can restore the damage he's done to the community, to the father and to his brother. But Luke tells us, and Jesus tells us that, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. That is the point that Jesus wants you to see. That it is not him feeling repentance. It is not him feeling sorry. Will he repent? The father doesn't know. Will he say, I'm sorry? The father doesn't know. Is he bringing back the money? The father doesn't know. The father is barely seeing him from afar off. And he says, that is my son. He walks, he walks like him. Yeah, that is, yep, he's got all his limbs, yeah. He looks dirty, but yeah, I can, I can clean that. I can handle that, I can deal with that. He, he, he looks all right. And he was filled with compassion. That compassion, that goodness of God is what Jesus wants his listeners, the scribes and the Pharisees who were grumbling to see. Because he says that, and the father ran and embraced him and kissed him. You know, in the Islamic faith, they teach that in Kenya, there's a lot of influence from Islamic faith. And there's a lot of free debates between many Kenyans and the Muslims and the Christians. They call it mjadal. They, if you go to places in squares in the city, you find big groups and the Christians will talk and the Muslims will talk and they debate. And one of the things they say that the story we have in Luke shows that a man can be saved without a savior, without Yeshua, as they call him. That's in the Quran, Surah Az-Zumar, which is chapter 39, verse 53. That you don't need a savior. You don't need Jesus. This story shows that you can go to the Father directly if you repent. They miss the sacrifice of the Father. They miss the pain of the Father. They, they miss this point where Jesus is trying to show you that the Father ran and embraced him and kissed him. Because you see, in this culture, fathers just don't run. No. For them to run, for him to run, it means he had to lift up his robe. And according to what God told them, that when they build an altar, they must make sure they don't put steps. Because if they go up and someone peers under their robe, it will expose their nakedness. So putting up your robe to run, that will be exposing your nakedness. And in this culture, fathers just don't run. They walk in a dignified, staccato style that carries his influence and status in the community and they focus and everybody knows that this is a father. He commands some space in this community. He is respected. 
Somebody said that I never understood this parable until I went to the Middle East to study to be a pastor. When he went there, he saw a man being hit by a car because fathers just don't run. Then it dawned on him that there is more to it. But in this case, the father ran. And the word run used there in the Greek word for sprint. He was not jogging. He sprinted to his son. He's trying to probably beat the community from performing the ceremony of the Kezazar. He wants to get to the son before anybody can get to him. He's seeing his chance and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. It shows you the humility by which he did it. It shows you the coming down to a level of ridicule. He's already suffered enough ridicule when the boy sold everything and moved out. Now he's subjecting himself in the eyes of everybody by running in front of them in broad daylight and is sparing nothing to save his son. And when he reached there, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So what happened to that sentence where in verse 19 he was saying, treat me as one of your hired servants. It's not there. He's edited it. He's cut it out. What happened? Was he not expecting the father to embrace him like that? Was he shocked? <laughs> Was he surprised? <laughs> what made him change his mind? Probably thought to himself that I'll just let it now roll because this is beyond me. I had planned it to go my way, but it is not obviously going something else that I didn't expect. I didn't expect my father to treat me like this. I didn't expect him to handle this like this. I've really, really hurt this man and I wanted to be a servant, but I better not even mention that now. Because the compassion of the father is so palpable, is so obvious, he can tell that the father has run to him. He, he didn't imagine in his wildest expectation that this would happen. And he gives his... But the father said quickly to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. I'll probably not dwell on the elements mentioned there. But the important thing here is the father has not even given him time to finish his speech. He's not even mentioned his being sorry or repentant. The father has already showered him with all these gifts. How extravagant is that? I thought he spent all when he gave him all. But the father has got unlimited resources. He seems to have this well where he just gets these things and he just throws things at, and he gives him a kingly reception. Because those things are for the king, the robe, the ring, and the shoes. He gives, he gives him a status that he didn't have even before he left. The father has been so extravagant to this man. And Jesus wants his audience to see that. That he is so rich, he is so extravagant, his love is so limitless that nothing the boy can do can diminish it. And uh, he said again, bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. There's a lot of celebration going on in the air and music and feasting. Everybody's happy until the elder brother comes back home. Notice that they are both coming back home. The younger brother came back home and the Elder brothers just come back home, but now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the servant said to him, Your brother, mate, it's your brother. He has come, 
and your father has killed the fattened calf because of he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and he refused to go in. That is where Jesus wants them to see because he's speaking to them. When Jesus has received this, the, the sinners, when he has received the tax collectors, they are so angry and they refused to join the party. Because the Bible tells us that there's so much joy and celebration when one sinner repents and comes to the Father. But here we see a group of people who are so angry. Probably this is what we should be speaking to ourselves about, not repentance. This is what we should be focusing on, that we are probably being spoken to here. Sometimes we see people walk into the church and we are like, who are these people? Sometimes we see a brother who had backslidden for years and comes back and we are like, so where have you been? One pastor said that when he was struggling with alcoholism, he used to go to church and whenever they caught a whiff of him, everybody would move away. Because he was reeking alcohol. And he had this struggle going on, but now he's a pastor, washed and clean. Sometimes we judge people too harshly. What are they doing here? And the Spirit speaks to us that this is your brother, this is your sister. He was, a, he was dead, but now he's alive. Celebrate. Come. Let us join together and welcome them home. But he was angry and he refused to go in. So the older brother is actually showing a resentment of the father probably more than the younger brother. Because his father comes out and entreated him. Now that word is used here to entreat, to entreat him means to call to one side and strive to appease or exhort, to comfort, to encourage. It is the same word Paul uses that we employ you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. The, the, the father is trying to reconcile him. He is now the problem. He's being reconciled. He wouldn't go in. You know, to begin with, this older brother should have been the one that was busy here helping the father to welcome the guests. He should have been seen visibly moving around, welcoming guests, talking to them, telling them about their brother, how they missed him. He's now home. To make it look like really this family has welcomed everybody in. And so all the guests are, are shocked. They, it's a public display. He wouldn't come in. They don't know what to do. Their father goes out and implores him, but he wouldn't come in. And Jesus says in the story that he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command. Is that a familiar statement that we always make? That we are keeping the commandments. We are the ones who know this. We are the ones who have been here. and We are the ones who know it all. And yet you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Now it is his friends, not his father's friends. Now he's isolating himself. But when this son of yours, now it is not my brother, now it is this son of yours, look at the contempt in his heart. Look at the judgment in his heart. He has come and devoured your property with prostitutes. How did he know that? How did he know that his brother was squandering money with prostitutes? You killed the fatted calf for him. You've never recognized me. You've never acknowledged me. And obviously he was serving the father out of a point of, not from a point of love. Because love doesn't ask for any pay. He's serving the father, he's keeping the commandments, he's, a, he's, he's exposing his legalism. Jesus wants his listeners to see that it is not about legalism, it's not about keeping this commandment, it's not about that. 
about more than that. The father is more concerned about the relationship that was broken. The rebellious boy has come back. The rage of the community has been stayed. There is peace and harmony once more. And the only element missing is the older brother. Who probably is you and I. It is interesting to note whether they understood him or not. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. It is fitting. It was meet for us to welcome your brother like this. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost. He is found. The father is trying to employ him with all means and talk to him. This message is more about this brother because that is the reason he was telling this parable. They were grumbling. And so he told them this parable. It is about this older brother more than the younger brother. He wants you to see that the younger brother has no problem. The problem is the older brother. When we see people come to Christ, how happy are we when we see people backslide? How fast are we to judge them? So the question is, will his listeners be reconciled with the father who is telling them the story? Will we be reconciled with Jesus who is telling us this parable? Or will their hardness of heart, like Pharaoh hardened his own heart, not allow it? Well, of course, you know the ending of the story as it played out in history. Because Jesus did not tell, want to tell them this part. That he is the father. Because they hated him. They grumbled. For the way he accepted sinners. And prostitutes. And Jesus leaves the story hanging. But there's a commentator who has extrapolated the story. And I will use that to finish the story, Kenneth Bailey says, then the older son in great anger took his stick and struck the father. This is from the cross and the prodigal son, page 87. So the Pharisees, the scribes, the people who were grumbling, they never reconciled. They took Jesus. They handed him over. They judged him. They put him on the cross. And they nailed him. They got rid of him. It was easier for them than to accept their brother back. May God bless us with this message. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your extravagant love. We want to thank you for loving us to the ultimate. That no matter what we do, and no matter where we go, and no matter how low we sing, that your love is enough save us, to give us eternal life in Christ Jesus. This is our prayer, Christ Jesus.